this is the second video on systems of linear equations. We have two objectives in this video. We're going to define some more terms, and then we're going to find the null space of a matrix. It may seem a little tedious to uh, spend so much time defining terms, but definitions are really important, especially in linear algebra, uh, because we use the definitions when we are proving theorems and solving problems. I'm going to go through the definitions in this video pretty quickly, just uh, for the sake of time but make sure that you study them carefully when you are proving theorems and solving problems and as you uh, maybe look back at this video I encourage you even to pause the video uh, sometimes to take a careful look at uh, the definitions. Okay we start with column vectors and matrices. We will define a column vector to be an array of complex numbers. So the vector v here is uh, written v1, v2, v3, down to vn with the brackets around it, similar to the way we drew matrices, where v sub i is in c. In other words, these v's here are all complex numbers. If I want to refer to one of the numbers in v uh, in any position, I use notation like this. So v with the brackets around it and then the subscript i refers to the ith entry or component of v, or the number in uh, position i. Uh, sometimes we'll just refer to a column vector as a vector. Uh, later in the course we'll learn about other kinds of vectors and so we'll need to be careful to be specific and say what kind of vector are we talking about. But for now especially if it's obvious from the context we're talking about column vectors we may just say vector for short. A vector like this that has n numbers in it is called n-dimensional and the set of all n-dimensional vectors is called n-dimensional space and we use this uh, symbol C with a superscript n which we read CN to indicate n-dimensional space. We write vectors with a bold font, we write numbers uh, like the numbers inside a vector here with an unbolded font. We call these numbers scalars to distinguish them from vectors. The zero vector is as you might expect the vector that's just got all zeros in it and so we could use this notation. Remember this means uh, the number in position i of the zero vector and the zero vector is written just as the, the numeral zero bolded. We can see what the zero vector in cn looks like here if we just write out all the zeros which we often do to emphasize that all the entries in the zero vector are zero. If we move on to matrices now we define an m by n matrix as a rectangular array of complex numbers. So a vector was a vertical array of complex numbers, like the zero vector up here, and zero itself is a complex number. There are m rows and n columns in this matrix. If I want to refer to a number inside a matrix, I use a notation similar to that for a vector. I put the name of the matrix, in this case a, inside little square brackets and then I use two numbers, two subscripts to indicate the position of that number. So the first number represents the row and the second number represents the column. I often use a simpler notation uh, like this to represent a matrix, particularly if I'm writing a proof or something, so that I don't have to write out all these numbers in the uh, matrix. In, th in this notation, a1 is a column vector, a2 is a column vector, an is a column vector. With that notation, a1 itself would be just the first column of the previous matrix. So we can imagine that this column is a1, this column is a2, and this column is an. Notice when I write by hand uh, vectors, I, I don't try to write a bold font. So we can tell from the context, am I referring to a vector or a scalar here? Well, I've labeled this entire column A1, and so I must be referring to a vector and not a scalar. Here are some uh, simple examples of vectors and matrices. Here's a vector U with three complex numbers and uh, I just arbitrarily said the third component of u is 2 minus i, just to give an example of using this notation to refer to a particular number inside a vector. There's nothing special about the third component, I just picked it arbitrarily. 
Here's a vector v. It's in C5 because there are five numbers in the column. And the fourth number, the fourth entry in v, is the square root of 2. Here's a 3 by 4 matrix. It's got three rows, 1, 2, 3, 4 columns uh, of complex numbers. And the number in position uh, 2, 4, so row 2, column 4, 1, 2, column 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, is 7 minus 3i. B is a 4 by 4 matrix, and the entry in row 3, column 2, is a 2. Okay, so let's continue generalizing systems of equations. Here is an arbitrary system of m equations with n variables. So there are m rows here, and the reason that I know there are m is if I look at the coefficients here, this is a 1, 1, a 2, 1, then we'd have a 3, 1, a 4, 1, down to a m, 1. So I can see the first index here, which indicates the row, goes from 1 down to m. So there are m rows. And then I can see how many columns there are by looking either at the coefficients here and looking at the second index, 1, 2, up to n, or just looking at the variables, x1, x2, up to xn, so I can see that there are n columns. And the coefficients, the a's, the constant terms on the right, the b's, and the variables, the x's, they all represent complex numbers. In the previous video we learned how to solve systems and linear equations. We never really formally defined the solution of a system. So we'll say the solution of a system of uh, linear equations in n variables is an ordered list. So for technical reasons I won't get into now, we don't say that it's a set, we say that it's an ordered list, which I write like this, kind of like a, an ordered pair like we wrote last time, only there are, instead of just two uh, numbers, there are n numbers in here, where each of these numbers, each of these s's, is some complex number, and the definition says if we substitute s sub i in for x sub i for all of the variables, 1, 2, up to n, then the system of equation is satisfied, which means that every equation is true simultaneously. So if we look back at the system, if I were to replace x1 with s1 here and here and in every equation all the way down to here, and then x2 with s2 here and here down to here and all the way across and all the way down, xn with sn all the way down, then this equation would be true, this equation would be true, this equation would be true. In other words, multiply all these a's by all the s's, add them all up, and you'd get b1. Multiply all these a's by all the s's, and you'd get b2, etc. Then we define the solution set to be the set of all the solutions. So this is the definition of a single solution. The solution set is the set of all the solutions. I used the term consistent in the previous video without formally defining it. Here's the formal definition. If the solution set is non-empty, the system is consistent. If the solution set is empty, the system is inconsistent. So if we look back at the definition of a solution set, it's the set of all the solutions. Well, if there are no solutions, if there are no ordered lists that will satisfy all the equations simultaneously, then the solution set has nothing in it. There is still a solution set, it's just empty, and in that case the system is inconsistent. But if the solution set contains at least one solution, then the system is consistent. We saw last time the existence uniqueness theorem, which told us that there's only three possibilities for every linear system. Either the system has no solutions, which really means the solution set is empty, and then we would say that the system is inconsistent or the solution set contains a single unique solution, in which case it's not empty, and so we would say the system is consistent, or it contains infinitely many solutions when there's at least one free variable, and then it's still consistent because it's not empty. Okay, this next definition covers a lot of ground. We're going to define four different things all at once, but they're all related to each other. So here's a system of equations again, same arbitrary system we've been looking at before. If I write down the matrix of the coefficients, that's called the coefficient matrix. The solution vector is a solution written as a vector. 
So there could be a single unique solution vector or there could be infinitely many. The constants, if we put those into a vector, now that we know what column vectors are, we can call that the constant vector. And then the augmented matrix that we saw last time is defined formally as the matrix A augmented with the vector B. And this little vertical line here means you augment or simply write the column vector B at the end of matrix A. So after you write the last column, the nth column of matrix A, you write another column, the n plus first column, and you just write down the vector B as the last column of matrix A. And it would look like this if we write it as a row of column vectors. Okay, and then finally in this section, we define the matrix representation of a system with this shorthand notation. We use the letters LS for linear system, and then in parentheses we put the coefficient matrix and the constant vector, and that will completely specify the system. If we look back here, this is a lot to write down. But instead of writing all of that, I can just write L, S, A, comma, B, and I've got to say what the coefficient matrix is and what the constant vector is, but then every time after that that I want to refer to the system, I just have to write this, and I don't have to keep writing this all the time. So it's just a little shorthand notation for convenience. Okay, so now we're getting on to our last objective here. We're going to define the null space of a matrix and do a little example about how would you find such a thing. But of course we have some more definitions to, to go through first before we can do that. So now we're going to define a homogeneous system. Uh, it's kind of a fancy term, homogeneous. Uh, it just means it's a system where the constant vector is the zero vector. Or another way to think of it is the constant term in every equation is just zero. So instead of b1, b2 down to bm, you just have all zeros. And we can write it like this using our convenient notation for a linear system. It's a linear system with the coefficient matrix A and then the constant vector is the zero vector. It turns out that every homogeneous system has the trivial solution, so we're going to define that first. The solution vector x equals zero is called the trivial solution to the system of linear equations, and this theorem says every homogeneous system has the trivial solution and it's therefore consistent. This is important. It means that every homogeneous system is consistent and it's there are no inconsistent homogeneous systems. And you can just see this by direct substitution. This is the first proof I think we've done in the course. So just a quick comment about the formal format of a proof. We'll uh, be looking at a lot of proofs in the class and you'll even be writing some. And when we uh, write a proof, we need to indicate the beginning of the proof and the end. And it's traditional to write a little box like this. It could be a, an open box or a closed box. I use a closed box just because it's a little easier to see. Um, sometimes in older books you might see QED, which is an abbreviation for a Latin phrase, which essentially means the end of, a, the, end of the proof. But most modern books just use the square, and that's what I use. All right, so what does this proof say? This, as I said, is a proof by direct substitution. So we're just going to plug in uh, the trivial solution. This theorem claims that the trivial solution is a solution for this homogeneous system. Um, one quick note here, the name trivial solution, this is a definition. That doesn't mean that, that, that it is in particular a solution to anything. Uh, it's just what we're calling this. So you could say that your name is the smartest person in the world, but that doesn't make you the smartest person in the world. That's just your name. If you want to call something a solution, that's fine, but that doesn't make it a solution. This theorem uh, proves that it actually is a solution. So we're just going to replace all the x1s with zeros and all the x2s and all the xn's with the zeros all the way across. And you can see these are just uh, complex numbers. Well, if I mul no matter what a11 is, if I multiply it by 0, I'll get 0. And that will happen all the way across. So this will be 0 and 0 and 0, this one. And every term here is just going to be 0. And we're just adding up a bunch of zeros. So of course, we will get all zeros on the right side. And so the trivial solution is a solution to this system. That doesn't mean it's the only solution. It's just a proof that it is a solution. From the existence uniqueness theorem, we know that 
there are two possibilities now. The trivial solution could be the only solution, or it could be one of infinitely many. Okay, now finally we get to the null space of a matrix. This uh, definition will make sense a little bit later when we define what a vector space and a subspace is, but for now it's just a name. The null space of an m by m matrix A, written like this, a capital N with an A in parentheses next to it, is the solution set of this homogeneous system. So if I, I'm asked to find the null space of the matrix, well, I solve the system that has that matrix as its coefficient matrix, and that solution set is the null space. So here's an example of finding the null space of a matrix. Notice, uh, in order to solve this problem, you have to understand what this notation means. So if you don't know what the notation means, you're going to have a hard time solving the problem. This means null space of A. And A is given to us here. It's this uh, 3 by 3 matrix. Now, these numbers are all real numbers, but that's OK. Real numbers are complex numbers. And we will often use uh, examples with real numbers in them in the class just to keep the examples simpler, even though um, it's possible that any of these numbers could be a complex number. Well, by the definition of the null space, the null space is the solution set to this homogeneous system. So I just took each number in the first row and made that the coefficient of the x1, x2, and x3 terms, and it likewise for the second and third rows. But to solve this system, what I do is write down the augmented matrix. So usually, I just skip this step. I go right from the matrix, and I augment with zeros. And actually, as we'll see later, don't even really need to do this step. But uh, for now, we'll include it. And I'll explain later why we don't need to include the zeros. So if we augment A with a column of zeros, it's the constant column, row reduce it. Remember the tilde means row reduce, and I did this on a computer. It row reduces like this, and I can write down the corresponding system. So x1 plus 0x2 plus 4x3 equals 0. The first equation. Second equation says x2 minus 3x3 equals 0. And I can see my pivots here and here. And that means x3 is free. Remember, the last column does not correspond to a variable. That's just the constant column. So I solve for the dependent variables x1 and x2 in terms of the free variable x3. And then I can write my solution set. So the null space is the solution set. The way we wrote this last time was we would write an ordered triple, if you will, with x1, x2, and x3. Well, x1 is minus 4x3, x2 is 3x3, and x3 is just x3. And then the vertical bar means such that x3 is in C. Now that we know how to write column vectors, we can use vector notation, which is a little simpler. Instead of writing an ordered triple here, we can just write a column vector in C3 with the same components. And then we say such that x3 is in C. So here's the null space. The null space is simply the solution set to the homogeneous system. OK, so we defined a bunch more terms related to systems and linear equations and their solutions, and then we saw how to find the null space of a matrix. So now when you see these terms, you should know what they mean. And if you're asked to find the null space of a matrix, you should be able to do that as well.